Hey everyone, I'm John Negroni. I'm the film editor for theyoungfolks.com. I'm also the host of the Cinema Hawks podcast, so if you can't get enough of my movie takes, and that would be surprising if you did, then I definitely suggest you check that out. Uh, I'm talking about all the latest films on there. Our episode about Encanto and 8-Bit Christmas is currently on that podcast, so if you want a big old discussion about those movies, I talked about it with my fellow co-host, Will Ashen. It's awesome. But for now, I'm going to talk about a movie that I have been meaning to talk about for a while now. I actually wasn't able to see it early. It's kind of funny, actually, because this movie, The Power of the Dog, it just came out on Netflix this past Wednesday, and I was expecting it to get a screener for it, and uh, like a DVD screener, and I literally got it right before I started recording. I will prove it. I have it right here. And to be clear, I am not uh, taking for granted how awesome it is to get screeners. It really is a cool thing. It's the best thing about like doing this job. Uh, but yeah, these came in uh, just now. And <laughs> so I, I'm a little bit late on my review anyway, but it's cool. It's awesome to have a physical copy of the movie. And uh, that said, The Power of the Dog. It is the long-awaited Western drama that I know I've been hoping to see from the New Zealand director and screenwriter Jane Campion, the wonderful Jane Campion, who really releases films at a pretty slow clip. She doesn't come out with them very often, but when she does, people really pay attention, myself included, because I think over the years, she's certainly cemented herself as one of our best filmmakers. She was the second woman ever nominated for Best Director at the Oscars. I think for that same film, she was the first female director to ever receive the Palme d'Or at Cannes. Uh, Cannes, excuse me. Um, yeah, and those films were for The Piano. And I think The Piano is probably her most well-known film, I want to say, to the broader public. Uh, that movie came out in 1993, so a long time ago. It stars Holly Hunter, Sam Neill, Harvey Keitel, Anna Paquin, one of her first roles. Certainly worth a look if you haven't seen The Piano. Good film. Her new film, though, is called The Power of the Dog, which is based on Thomas Savage's eponymous book, or book of the same name, and it really boasts a tremendous cast, this movie. And real quick, I want to say I have the book right here, too. I forgot about that. Um, the movie stars the one and only Benedict Cumberbatch, who I think is probably the only actor, I think, who really is... A uh, big, big threat against Will Smith for his role in King Richard. I think the two are going to be certainly front runners come award season once we have the Oscars kicking up uh, here soon. Benedict Cumberbatch plays a cattle driver named Phil Burbank who owns a ranch with his brother George, who is played by the always quietly strong Jesse Plemons, an actor who has really snuck up on me over the last decade. Right away, their dynamic, their their whole energy between these two guys is very clearly written. Phil is a miserable, grumpy man. Nothing pleases him. Nothing satisfies him. He mocks his brother George relentlessly and constantly for things that are ridiculous, like his weight and how he has a more reserved personality. You get the sense that Phil wants something from George that George just can't give him. But it all seems to roll over George's back because we get the sense that this is nothing new. He's long had to endure his brother's really annoying personality, which is really all bark, no bite. I guess that's a pun for Power of the Dog. Anyway, the story takes place in 1925 Montana. Montana, beautiful state. I've been to Montana. I absolutely love it. And George falls in love with a widow named Rose, who is played by Kirsten Dunst. And her role in this is, it reminded me a lot of her really good performance in The Beguiled, uh, the 2017 remake. And I remember that, you know, Clemens and Dunster married in real life, and that's always charming. I, I really love seeing those actors together. Uh, I never did see Fargo's season, whichever it was that they both are in. I think that was how, I don't know if it was how they met, but that's how they kind of, you know, their romance sort of seeded from there. So great story. Anyway, Rose, played by Dunst, has a son named Peter, who is played by Cody Smith McPhee. You might recognize Smith McPhee from his role as Nightcrawler in a couple of the recent X-Men movies like Dark Phoenix, and I think his intro was Apocalypse. You might also recognize him from films like The Road, Let Me In, a few more. Now, at first glance, Peter, he's a teenage character. You get, the, I think he's supposed to be like college age. He's essentially the polar opposite of Phil. He's kind-hearted. He's sensitive. He's expressive. He's artistic. While Phil presents himself as this man's man, you know, who learned it all from his mentor, 
Bronco Henry, whom he's constantly going on about. Now that said, there might be a lot more to fill than what I just said as you, of course, watch the film. And this collision of personalities, this really what can go wrong next setup for the plot, it's the it's the crux of the story as soon as Rose and Peter have to start living with not just George, but also the far less manageable Phil, who makes a habit of raising the tension in any given situation merely because he just dislikes other people, or at least wants other people to think or know that he dislikes them. First of all, The Power of the Dog is an unconventional Western, very unconventional. It does have the fundamentals of what makes a Western look and feel like one gripped pretty tightly. It has sweeping frontier vistas with a slow burn cinematography approach by Ari Wegener. It has a folk heavy composition by Johnny Greenberg, who's really having just an amazing 2021. But usually we see atmospheric elements like this added to Westerns more similar to what you would see like True Grit, the remake from 2010, or Hostels, or last year's News of the World with Tom Hanks, or Netflix's other 2021 Western, The Harder They Fall with Idris Elba and Jonathan Majors. These films similarly present frontier life more realistically than we've seen before. They show it as a really miserable experience where life is difficult. It's hard, it's dirty, it's dangerous, and it's morally ambiguous. But these themes all still tend to come out through something we recognize from Westerns back, 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 you know, when Westerns were the major genre of the day, and that is the visceral excitement and thrill of seeing sheer violence on screen. So I'm talking about gunfights, fist fights, fights of any kind, really. But the real power behind the power of the dog is in how the absence of violence is just as threatening. That's really what this movie is about. And we can more reasonably understand how a repressed and certainly toxic man can abuse other people psychologically, bringing them to their breaking point. And for reasons that do have cohesion and have narrative importance, and because this is a long movie, we get that rounded character to explain what's really going on, at least in a way that feels satisfying. To the point where you worry so much more about the long-term effects of trauma than the immediate effects of blunt force trauma. And it's fitting then that the film takes place just a few years before the Great Depression, 1925. I believe the, the stock market crash was until 1929. So contextually, you can imagine this this could be even worse. This this whole existence is years away from being even more challenging and tumultuous for these people. The film is terrific, I think, at telling a traditional story about aggression without showing traditional aggression. At first, it is a bit odd. It's even a little disorienting because based on what you're seeing, you expect so many terrible things to happen and they just end up not happening, at least not in the way you expect, because something probably worse happens, even though you can't quite put your finger on the nature of the tension that you're feeling, the mere threat of possible dangers simmering underneath what is seen. It's a grounded Western film, essentially, and what else should we expect, I think, from Campion at this stage in her career? So I think the power of the dog works as well as it does because every character pulls off their role with full commitment. Uh, Cumberbatch will rightfully, I think, get heaps of praise for being so against type here as someone truly unlikable, yet he is the engine behind what makes this plot exactly that. Uh, and peeling back his complexities ends up revealing almost like diamonds that this film has to offer, even though it has such a rough exterior. And similarly, Smith McPhee has to hold his own against other powerhouse actors here, especially Benedict Cumberbatch, and he arguably has two of the most important scenes of the entire movie. They hinge on his performance being just right in terms of being expressive. It's not really through dialogue. If he had played it too overt or too subtle, the ending would be jello. Instead, The Power of the Dog is closer, I think, in quality to Paul Thomas Anderson's There Will Be Blood, which is a superior superior film overall, but not by all that much. But it is definitely similar in terms of its unconventional approach to depicting the West. Unfortunately, this movie does have the problem that 
isn't really its problem, which is that it frankly lacks that sort of mainstream commercial appeal. It has the audacity to require patience from the viewer, and I expect a lot of people won't have that patience for their own reasons, and certainly not for any reasons that I find unforgivable or anything like that. Now, fortunately, Jane Campion, she makes movies without giving that sort of thing in mind in terms of like, well, what, what are people going to think? Is it going to sell well? And it's great to see Netflix putting real money behind films like this at this scale. So people who are hungry for artistic endeavors on this level can get their rope or lasso around this one. I had to. <laughs> uh, I don't really have a lot of extra credits here. I, I, the only thing that I want to do for extra credits is just say, that there are a bunch of things I didn't talk about in this movie, particularly involving the Phil character. And the reason I didn't is because I just think it's something that you don't want to give away. And I did watch the trailer for the first time after I saw the movie, and I tried to essentially go by what that trailer reveals itself because I think that trailer is very excellent. It doesn't give too much away, although arguably it gives a few things away that I wouldn't have liked to. Uh, that said, I think this one is really tremendous. It's a big movie. It's a movie that I think critics are really going to gravitate toward. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to fare as a best picture contender. I think at this point it, with the Oscars, Belfast is essentially still the front runner, although there is a lot more energy at this current moment, I think, for Licorice Pizza, a film that I talked about pretty re recently. Uh, I think the, the big guns right now are this movie, Power of the Dog for sure, Belfast, Licorice Pizza, and uh, I would say King Richard. Uh, otherwise, there are a few other movies that are kind of sneaking around in the periphery. I think Dune is up there as well. I think The Tragedy of Macbeth, which I'll be seeing soon. There are all kinds of other films that we can compare. But if you wanted to watch an awards film rather safely, and maybe you already saw Tick, Tick, Boom, uh, you can definitely see The Power of the Dog now on Netflix along with that film. And there are a lot of Netflix films that uh, are definitely coming up that are award-centric. Uh, I have uh, The Lost Daughter, which I'm hoping to check out soon. And I, you know, this isn't really, I don't know if this is really an award centric movie, but I'm also hoping to talk about Benedetta very soon. I saw that film earlier this week and a swan song as well. I can't wait to talk about swan song. Uh, I apologize. It's just, I'm in the, I'm not, I'm not in a review zone right now for this, which is why I haven't really released a lot of stuff for the last week. Uh, essentially it's because I'm watching a lot of things and I'm trying to kind of get everything into order. But if there's anything that I've missed that I haven't talked about, uh, I know that I didn't end up talking about drive my car, a really, really great three hour film, um, that I kind of missed the boat on reviewing because, uh, frankly, I just didn't have the time. But again, if there's anything you are hoping to hear from me about, as always, definitely reach out to me whenever you can or however you can, and I'll be sure to oblige. The Power of the Dog is now available to watch in select theaters, or you can stream it right now on Netflix, as I mentioned. I definitely like this one. I, I, this is not my favorite film of the year. It's uh, it, possibly in my top 20, probably top 25. Uh, it's, But I don't think this is a top 10 film for me in 2021. It's a film that I definitely respect and I appreciate. I admire it. I had a good time watching it. I don't know if I would say that exactly, but I certainly ate up the screenplay and it's a film that I think is really worth analysis and study and watching, but it's not a film that really affected me on a lot of levels, a few levels, because I think the ending has a really good payoff and it's just a good ending in general. But it's not a film that I walked away from that's really been haunting me uh, compared to some other films. Uh, another film like Nightmare Alley. I completely forgot that I watched Nightmare Alley last night. Um, that video is coming up. All right, that's it for me, though. I will see you all in the next one. Have a wonderful rest of your week and early December.